Let's but, talk about your grandfather and about Spectre and how those two things came to coalesce in the original idea for how you're going to make this movie. They were the same person. Oh, okay. Um, my grandfather fought in the in the war. Obviously, you can see that the movie is dedicated to him. He fought in the war from 16 to 18, and he was 17 years old. But he didn't speak of the experience at all to his own children. It was only when he got into his 70s that he started talking to his grandchildren about it. And so I have very vivid memories of him. I must have been about 11 or 12. He was a very small, wiry, theatrical, great storyteller. And we all adored him. And he, But he told stories that were shocking. Um, they weren't stories of heroism or bravery. Um, they were unadorned stories of, uh, of horror, really, the, the scale of the war um, and how lucky he was to have survived it. Um, you know, and the, the, the luck and coincidence and accidental heroism. He won two medals, but he claimed that it was entirely by accident. And he told one story about, um, uh, about being sent as a messenger across no man's land with one message. And it was that image of that little person in the mist carrying that one message that really inspired the movie. Um, I just thought, what if he kept going? And that's what uh, we turned into this story. The bond, uh, uh, I'm assuming you mean <laughs> when, I, when I, what gave me the courage to write the story was having spent five years on the Bond movies, in a sense, creating with the writers something from nothing. Um, in both cases, I, I didn't inherit anything at the beginning of the process and I sat in the room with the writers and watched something be created from the blank page. And I did think to myself, Perhaps I could do this myself for the first time. And um, so that's what drove me to put together a story. Um, and I worked out the various story points and beats. And then I stalled. And then I'd already worked on a script very successfully, I felt, with Christy um, for something that, for reasons I won't bore you with, didn't come off. But it, it seemed an obvious port of call. And she was the person who crystallized it and brought it uh, into script form. Christy, when you have the idea of the form and you also have the idea of the story, which one wins? And how does form start dictating story and how does story dictate form in terms of how you're going to shoot the film and what you can and cannot do story-wise? I mean, story always wins. I think everyone on this stage will tell you story wins. I mean, you can do amazing things with a camera, but what's the point if you don't care about the characters you're following? So that, I mean, we sat down and when we first kind of wrote this we never thought oh is any of this achievable in fact I often thought most of it was completely unachievable <laughs> um, but I went with it because I was working with Sam and, and he knew what he was doing um, so yeah story is, is always the principle. Roger you have this early conversation with Sam about his intentions and it's obviously a, a bold idea at what point do you start trying to figure out whether or not it's attainable and what you're going to have to do to attain it? Uh, way after we'd figured out the, what the shots were, we we started off just discussing the overall sort of conception of how we were going to move the camera relative to the actors and to you know to visualize the story. But we we said we had this pact that we wouldn't think about the technology, we wouldn't think how to do it. We we would sort of dream about what we wanted to do, and it was only after you know we storyboarded for months and then we started rehearsing with Dean and George for months as well and it was only when really all the shots were laid out and then then we sort of broke it down into sections depending on the location that we were on depending on the uh the performance and how sam wanted to break it down into sections of performance and uh, and also sometimes in terms of what equipment would do that particular piece of work you know something else you can't do lee is you can't fix it in post the shot either has to work or it doesn't and what does that mean editorially in terms of how you are looking at footage that's coming in and what does and does not make your edit? It's pure terror <laughs> on a daily basis, fear. Because every time I looked at it, we were building the film as we were going and I was talking to Sam a lot every morning and the film just had to work. There was no going back. It wasn't the usual situation with coverage where you know we could look at something that was a little bit, you know, ropey and you could fix it in post you could polish it you could halve the length of it you could juxtapose the scenes you couldn't do any of that so this film had to be kind of perfect every day and that was um, kind of nothing I've experienced 
before and uh, it was, yeah, it was really exciting and it's like a, I sort of described it once as like Christmas because every morning, you know, you'd be watching each of these takes unfold and at one point there was 39 of them. <laughs> and uh, at some points, are there none of them if there's daylight issues or you don't get a shot that you yeah, actually... I mean, some days the guys, you know, I come in and my assistant, I'd sit there all happy to unwrap my Christmas present. He'd say, you got nothing. <laughs> a lump of coal. And uh, so, you know, and then we'd realise, we'd hear during the day that they couldn't shoot, but, you know, they used that to their advantage and rehearsed and then, you know, because we're all worried about schedule. And I can't help but be worried when I'm ever on a film and, you know, you're running behind or the shoot's running behind because the pressure will then come from the studio to drop sequences. Well, ha-ha, they can't do it. <laughs> so it's like studio notes on this film, ha-ha. <laughs> we weren't happy with the pace at the beginning. Well, tough shit. <laughs> you own it. We've talked about some of the technical challenges of making a film like this as an actor, Dean, when you are having to do not only long takes, you're probably pretty far away from Sam where he is watching your work. How much is the rehearsal process important, not just in knowing where you have to be at a certain point in a shot, but that character instinct becoming almost organic because there's so much muscle memory through that rehearsal? Exactly, I mean, it was really crucial for everybody. I mean, we started rehearsing six months before we started shooting, um, which, I mean, as an actor, is pretty rare. You know, you don't really get to rehearse. You just sort of step on set in front of an already set up camera, and you're still really learning about your character as you go along. Whereas this, we had the luxury to learn about our character, learn the root of the men, and and, uh, and that's basically, you know, I think it was Roger that just said, you know, we was in an empty field six months before shooting, literally walking and talking the scenes, you know, as they would be in the full pace um, and stabbing stakes in the floor as we went along, you know, like there'd be the corner, mm -hmm. you know, there's the start point, there's the finish point. And uh, we, we pretty much did that with every scene, didn't we? Um, yeah. George, I'm gonna ask you about one of the final scenes in the film when you're running and it looks like you're in an NFL game. You are just getting creamed. <laughs> it looks as if what Roger is shooting is what's really happening. Can you talk about that scene and how much is observed and how much is random people actually running into you? It was random people running into <laughs> me. <laughs> Genuinely, we rehearsed that for, for weeks before, months before, and, and, and built the scene. You know, the first time we did it was with 20 crew members and a super souped up golf cart. <laughs> and then everyone who was there on the location scout, go, just get involved, get involved, see if you can run in between, see what it looks like. And then months later, we're there with two cranes in a, and a tracking vehicle with a crane on the back and two grips in costume because they can't get out of the shot. And all those explosions that you see were there practical practical effects and and we rehearsed it that that I make it through and and I didn't on the takes um <laughs> I got I got knocked over so but we just kept on going the rule was always don't stop until you hear cut so um so we just kept going Sam how are you directing the actors how close are you to their to them in performance uh because they're going the long distance and how do you know as a filmmaker, what takes are working? And because obviously you have your cinematographer, your editor who have to sign up, but what do you know or what are you looking for that might be different from them in terms of performance and how do you have conversation given the technical challenges that you're up against? <clears throat> well, you're hoping that by that time it's pretty telepathic, really. I mean, you've worked so long, everyone as a group. Mm -hmm. And what the extraordinary thing was about this movie is that every single member of every department was engaged in every shot because they had to be. Mm -hmm. So it was none of that, well, this, is, this refers to this department, this refers to that department. Everybody was involved in everything from the very beginning. And even though the actors were rehearsing you know, across a six-month period, all they were really doing was being part of prep from day one, which is what we would normally do. But we couldn't move without that sense of what their natural rhythms would be, the rhythm of walking, moving, running, the rhythm of speech. What you're trying to do on a daily basis is judge rhythm and tempo, which is something you would never normally do. Um, but because I'm from the theater, that, that's a more common experience for me to judge the rhythm and the pace of a whole two hour, two and a half hour story without recourse to cuts. So, but you've got so many more elements in this than you do with a play. Everything's moving all the time. The camera's always moving. The characters are always moving. The landscape's moving, the light's changing. 
and you've got background too and any number of things can derail you so what i was doing was i was working off a very large monitor screen which i had to because i had to see every detail because i didn't want to let anything slip by and that meant that i was stuck in a in a in a van as was roger and often we would be at the end of the scene or at the beginnings either way they would be starting you know, half a mile away and coming towards us or, or we would be at the beginning and they would just disappear. And there were a number of times when I had to say cut and they couldn't hear me. They just carried on <laughs> acting away down the hill and over the horizon, you know, blissfully unaware that we were, that the camera wasn't on them anymore. I mean, and there, and there were days, there were days, I mean, there's a, you've seen the movie now, there's a colonel who sits in a, his, uh, his car uh, in the Mark Strong scene uh, played by a wonderful actor called Bill McCabe. And... You know, his experience of that was three minutes before he had his, his scene was hearing way in the distance, action, like that. And then eventually, two minutes into the scene, someone in the, you know, AD hiding in the back seat of the car went, now. And then he did his scene, out came Mark, and he played his scene with George, and then off they went, and there was another three minutes went by, and eventually, and cut, like this. And after about five takes, I heard this rather forlorn voice looking around, said, Sam, and I came trotting out, which again was over a hill, you know, and he said, where's the camera? And I said, it's just behind you. He said, oh, he said, I absolutely no sense of where the crew, I can't see anybody. I don't know where the ADs are. There's no sign of a camera. I thought I was being punked, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, and at the end of the day, bless him, he said, well, that was one of the most enjoyable but strangest days I've ever had on a movie. Because it was like being part of a reenactment. You know, he was surrounded by 300 soldiers in full costume and everyone was completely focused and doing it. But there was no evidence that there was a movie being made. And I, that really tickled me. But that is sometimes what it felt like, you know, that you couldn't see the crew. And, and, and often, the, you know, George and Dean, you know, you know had no there was no sense because obviously we're shooting 360 a lot of the time so we're hiding things or we're, or we're miles away there have been a lot fair number of movies about world war ii maybe not as much about world war one i, I want to ask you a little bit about what the war means to you you're not your film is not about the battle of the Somme, where more than a million people were killed or injured fighting over a couple of miles of land when you grew up when you heard stories about world war one what did it mean to you and what do you hope this film means to people who don't know about what happened on those battlefields. I grew up in Devon and I still have a place in Devon <clears throat> and all the little villages and towns in Devon have a, a memorial to the soldiers that died in the First World War and the Second World War but I particularly remember, remember crosses dedicated to the soldiers that died in the First World War and sometimes you'll, you'll be in a tiny village and you'll see name after name the same and you're kind of like five, six, seven or eight male members of that same family died in that war and a village is like a tiny little village in in the countryside and uh I, that not just sticks with me if i go back there it is those and so i really hope it's not a history lesson but i hope it really inspires people to look into the war a bit more and just because it was such a crucial event not only in the history of the europe but the way the world's changed since then and yeah, I agree. And there's something, you know, one should remind oneself that these men were fighting over a free and unified Europe, which in our country certainly at the moment would be good to remember. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, you know, the, 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 the winds that were blowing before this war began are blowing again. And, you know, there's, there's, it's worth uh, remembering that a war that can get buried under a sort of avalanche of nationalistic cliches about us doing it all on our own was in fact a version of hell. And, and it's over 100 years and I hope it's not forgotten. Sam, Christy, Roger, Lee, Dean, George, thank you for bringing us your film. <laughs>